Hello everyone. In this talk, I will show you the amazing research that we do in the Earth Science and Engineering Department at Imperial College London. So, of course, I will only show you uh, a small portion of, of, of what we do, some examples, some concrete examples, uh, but it is quite important that, um, you know, it's, it's really only a very small fraction of what we do. And of course, we, are, we have many more people doing many more different things. Um, first, before to start, let me introduce myself. So, my name is Valentin Laurent. I am a senior teaching fellow in the um, ESE department at Imperial. And I am a geologist specialized in structural geology, metamorphic rocks. Um, probably don't really know metamorphic rocks, that's, that's okay. It's not the aim of this, of this presentation. Geochronology, which is about dating the rocks. And I'm also doing a different kind of research, pedagogical research and educational uh, research. And I will say a few words about uh, what I'm doing in that at the end of, of this talk, showing you a concrete example of, of what um, I am doing. But let's start with some people in the department and, 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 and giving you a taste of what they do. And let's start with Sanjeev uh, Gupta, Professor Sanjeev Gupta. Uh, which is the director of the Earth Planetary and Science undergraduate degree. And Sanjeev is a member of the scientific committee um, in charge of the Mars Perseverance Na NASA mission. So uh, Sanjeev is not directly uh, driving the rover, but Sanjeev is really part of the committee, the scientific committee, that decides what the rover is going uh, to see, where the rover is going to go, and which sort of rocks they are going to analyze. So it's quite exciting to know that we have um, we have many people working in this mission department, but Sanjeev has really a very important role. So Sanjeev is part of the Exploring Space uh, Research Group in, in our department. Um, in the same way as Philippa Mason, so you have a picture of Philippa here, and Philippa is involved in a different mission, which is the Venus Envision ESA, so the European equivalent of, of, of NASA um, mission. And she's also a member of the scientific committee. So this is a mission that have not yet um, started, launched, uh, but will be quite soon. And if I'm correct, it's in 2024. And the aim of this mission is to analyze Venus. And why Venus? Because Venus is really um, have a lot of characteristics similar to the Earth, sort of the same size, the same density, the same mass. And we are strongly interested to understand why the Earth and Venus has evolved in a completely different way, where well, there is life, for example, on, on the Earth and not um, on Venus, why th these two planets have very, very similar characteristics. Um, let's change uh, a research group and see to some people working in paleontology and life past and present. And here I give you the example of uh, Dr. Alan Spencer that you can see here, a picture of him. And Alan has, was, was part of a team who has really, really recently, it was just before Christmas, um, published a completely innovative um, paper showing some rare Jurassic fossils that reveals um, unseen uh, ammonite muscles in three dimensions. And you have a picture of that where the backlit shell with visible organs here in, um, in black. So some really, really interesting, really exciting research in, in paleontology as well that we do in, in the department. A lot of people are really working uh, more on like the environmental research, ocean and climate, um, fighting um, the climate crisis that we face actually. And here I give you two examples, starting with Dr. Dylan Rood, that you can see on the picture here with one of um, his PhD students in the lab. 
And a very recent study that Dylan has done was looking to the ice sheet history and sensitivity to climate change in uh, Greenland. So you can see them in the field in Greenland, really exciting to be able to mix like field work and direct observation and sampling uh, together with uh, lab work where Dylan and his team is directly collecting uh, some data to, um, to study climate change. The other example I'm showing from um, another people working in this ocean and climate group in, in our department is just our head of department, Professor Tina van der Fleet. Um, and, and Tina has done a lot of things um, on, on that topic. And here I'm just picking one example um, where in, in, a, in a quite recent study as well, where they studied the ocean's role in climate change and this was unraveled by cold water corals, studying cold water corals. You can see here a picture of, of Tina showing in 2008 when she saw her first iceberg sighting. And again, so mixing field observations and, and quite a lot of, uh, of lab work. Um, let's change again of, uh, of a research group and now have a look to people working in uh, natural hazards, researching natural hazards. And here's the example of Professor Saskia Goz that is here on the picture with her team of PhD students and, and postdoc. And Saskia is interested a lot uh, in the study of earthquakes and water that circulate in subduction zones, as you can see on, on the diagram here. So water that circulates in the, in the deep earth. Um, and finally, uh, I think this is my last example of another person, um, Dr. Matt Gange. I don't have a direct picture of Matt, um, but here is some students of Matt in Santorini Island. Um, and Matt has recently made the link between Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo in 1815 uh, and a big volcanic eruptions that happened in Indonesia. And what Matt was able to show from a scientific point of view, it was a really nice discovery that some volcanic ashes can enter the upper atmosphere. So before Matt's study, we thought, scientific thought, volcanology thought, that uh, volcanic ashes and volcanic plumes, so when you have a big eruptions, you know, you have this um, column of volcanic ash that is ascending above the eruption, and then the ashes just fall down. Uh, there was, um, at the time I am recording this research talk, a very recent um, eruption in Tonga Island. We saw exactly the same thing. You probably saw some pictures of the land completely in Tonga, completely recovered with, with ashes. And what Matt has shown is that... Um, so what I was saying is that before Matt's study, we thought that the ashes were sort of blocked into the lower atmosphere and then fall down and never enter the upper atmosphere. But Matt has shown that some electronically um, charged volcanic ashes, as you can see on the picture here, may be able to enter the upper atmosphere. And this had quite a, a big consequence, if you want. This will make the link with the Napoleon's defeat because... As the ashes enter the upper atmosphere, this has caused global poor weather after that, um, heavy rain episodes that have directly contributed to Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo that happened only two months um, after the eruption. So again, just a really short example of, of a kind of very, very interesting um, research that we do in, in our department. And... To finish, I'd like to show a slightly more detailed example of my own research. So I told you that I'm a geologist, a structural geologist. Really, my work is, is to go into the field, study the rock directly. But I'm also doing what I call pedagogical research. So pedagogical means um, how we teach. Yeah? So if you want, I'm trying to improve, to research the way we are teaching students. And, and, um, and yes, this is another domain of, of my research. And there is a, a recent study that we conducted with a student, so Louise, with Louise Guillaume. Louise was in her third year of study with us when we started the, um, the study, and now she has graduated. Uh, and we looked at fieldwork in the time of COVID-19. So, of course, 
you probably know by now that um, if you join us as an undergraduate um, student, um, you will uh, do quite a lot of field work. And geologists do even more field work than geophysicists, but everyone is doing field work. And of course, in the time of COVID-19, it was not possible to go directly into the field. So what the, the, the department has done is to develop um, quite a lot of virtual uh, field trip. As you can see on this picture here, there were immersive virtual field trip where each student were represented by an avatar and it, it really looks like a video game. It was really, really similar um, than to, to, to a video game. You were able in this virtual world to move, to run, to fly, to jump. And these were real virtual environments. So this is an example of Scotland. And we recreated a four kilometer square area in Scotland around Kinloch Leven, if you, for, for those of you who, who know that. Uh, it's, it's the usual place where our second year geologists go um, in uh, around May. And we have recreated this as a virtual environment, exactly the same one, um, using mostly, I will not enter into the details, but mostly we use a drone pictures. Uh, so one of our, so Matt Genge was able to, to go there um, and, and take a lot of drone pictures and to recreate this virtual environment. And in this virtual environment, of course, you have the virtual outcrops where the students are able to study the rock. And the students are able to discuss with each other. So it's really like a multiplayer video, uh, video game. And what we've done with Louis is to try to compare the students' learning experience during both virtual and outdoor fieldwork. Was virtual the learning experience during virtual fieldwork as good, or if you want, the equivalent to the student learning experience during outdoor fieldwork? So to that, we sent um, a survey uh, to some students. And, and yeah, before to say that the aim really of our study was to determine the student's attitude to physical and virtual fieldwork through three domains of learning. Cognitive, that directly relate to the level of understanding. So does the student understand, learn the same thing in virtual fieldwork and outdoor fieldwork? The psychomotor domains of learning that more reflect to a physical state. And you will see that we can replicate quite a lot of the psychomotor um, learning experience as well in a virtual fieldwork. That's a bit weird, but I will show you that. And, um, not weird, but a bit difficult to understand like, like this, but I will show you some example. And finally, through the affective domains of learning, which directly relate more to the emotional state, yeah? So, was, from an emotional point of view, the learning experience the same in outdoor and um, field work? And if not, what are the differences? And is it better? Is it worse? So, I was telling you that for that, what we did, uh, Louise and I, uh, is that to send a survey to students after they have done virtual fieldwork. So we have targeted students who've done outdoor fieldwork before the pandemic. Okay, so I think they were third year um, students the first time and then second year. And what is important to, to have in mind is that we send a survey to students who have done both outdoor fieldwork and virtual fieldwork, of course, as we want to compare the learning experience in both types of, of fieldwork. So this survey was composed of, of many questions. I've just shown you the answers here and how to, to read the, um, the answers is that you have two um, different colors. Most red color reflect to a disagreement to uh, the statements uh, with the dark red color strongly disagree. The intermediate red color disagree. The light red color somewhat disagree. And in the same way, um, in blue, it's more uh, different scales of agreement with a statement. Yeah, so let's take an example here. So two questions. I would prefer a fully virtual field trip as a student to be an offered alternative to physical field trips in the future. And you can see that most of the students disagree with the statement. Um, let's say it's like, uh, I think we had, yes, 30% saying yes. So it's like two thirds saying no, they would not prefer fully virtual field trip replacing completely outdoor field work, uh, while one third of the students say yes. But you can see that to the statement, I would like future field trips to contain virtual elements. Here, it's the contrary, two thirds or even a bit more um, of the students 
agreed with this statement. So just to say that, in summary to these two questions in the survey, it says that the students seem to have quite liked the virtual um, fieldwork but don't want virtual fieldwork to completely replace outdoor fieldwork. Let's have a look to two other questions and we will not go through all, all of them, two other statements. Um, I had a suitable learning uh, environment to participate fully in the um, in the virtual field work. Yeah, so most of the students said yes to that. And having the virtual app, so virtual app is this virtual environment. Yeah, improves the field trip. And here, practically all students agreed uh, with this with this statement. Yes. So compared to yeah. Um, having a virtual fieldwork that is not using this immersive 3D environment. Um, typically, I know that other geology uh, departments in the UK and, and also in France um, have done virtual fieldwork just by recording videos, for example. So some just the professors, the lecturer were able to go in the field. They just recorded them doing some geology in the field and they show that to the students. So you can see the difference. Um, or just using Google Earth, for example. So, what are our results? So, I show you we were looking to um, comparing the student learning experience through three domains of learning, the cognitive, psychomotor, and affective. And let's start with the cognitive domain of learning. So, you remember is really directly relating to the level of understanding, to the knowledge, really relating was, does the students learn as well during outdoor fieldwork and virtual fieldwork. And what I, I present you is like, um, of course, every time you have some pros, you have some cons, you have some advantage and disadvantages uh, for the virtual fieldwork. And it's what I am uh, like making a summary here, what our study um, concluded. So the advantages of virtual fieldwork compared to outdoor fieldwork from looking to the cognitive domain of learning um, is at first that the intended learning outcomes, so intended learning outcomes is really what we want the student to know after doing uh, the field work, are really similar, they were the same uh, in virtual field work than in outdoor field work. So just to say that we were able to replicate at least what we wanted the students to know, to learn during a field work, doing an outdoor field work, we were able to directly replicate that they were not changed after uh, the virtual field work. Um, the, in the virtual field work, we were able to record the introduction and, and the summaries. And this was a, a big advantage because uh, the students were able to hear something um, again, another introduction, another summary, if they didn't understand well the first time, or if you miss something, which happens quite a lot, it's, it's, it's possible in the virtual field, but of course in the outdoor field, we do the summary, we do the introduction one time, and if you miss it, you miss it, yeah? So this, what the students, what our survey shown is that the fact to have recorded introduction and summaries um, improve uh, the learning experience uh, of, of the students. The virtual fieldwork can support student learning experience in ways that will not be possible in outdoor fieldwork. And this is completely um, understandable by the fact that in virtual fieldwork, you don't have any barrier. You don't have any, I would say, safety barrier. You don't have any, um, yeah, like accommodation or travel barrier. If you want to study an outcrop in the morning in UK and then another outcrop, I don't know, in the, in, in, in the US or in Himalaya, you can in the virtual field work, of course you can't in the outdoor field work. Yeah? You have to go in a single place um, to expect to do just some small travel before one day to another or one outcrop to the other. Uh, so more or less what we can do in the virtual field work is, has no barrier. We can do everything we want, we want. And this is a strong advantage of virtual field work compared to outdoor field work. So directly relating to no logistical and safety barriers to learning, in the virtual field work, just what I said. And no difference with overall quality of students' work. So what we were able to um, see as a lecturer is that after the virtual field work that we did typically in Scotland, the one I showed a picture, what the students done, their work that they have done during the field work was of exactly the same quality compared to the quality of the work that the students done in the outdoor field few years before. So really, really interesting to say that from a cognitive domain of learning, it seems to be very similar. 
Um, about the disadvantages of virtual fieldwork compared to outdoor fieldwork, um, it was shown, the, the, our student survey shows that the students felt that they were able to get to acquire less data in the outdoor, in the virtual fieldwork compared to the outdoor fieldwork, which is completely understandable. Yeah, when you are in the field, in the outdoor fieldwork, you can go everywhere, you can have a look to you have a lot of information, yeah, a lot of rocks everywhere. While in the virtual field work, sometimes we are just showing pictures, or it's it's different. So I uh, completely understand that. And students were also missing a bit of the lack of face-to-face -face interactions, and they felt that this um, has a, a, a negative impact on their cogn cognitive domain of learning. Um, they felt that they were better able to understand by having face-to-face -face interaction. From a psychomotor um, domain of, of learning, yeah, so you remember psychomotor is a fact of, of moving really relate to the physical state. Again, the virtual fieldwork has some advantage and disadvantage. Let's start with the disadvantage because they are quite obvious, yeah. In the virtual fieldwork, you are not able to touch rocks, for example. And sometimes this is really important uh, to um, to identify minerals, to study the rocks for the for the students. So this was a negative impact. The resolution of the virtual fieldwork is not always as great as what you can see in the outdoor fieldwork. So again, it relates to um, being able to be in the field with the samples, looking at at it at different scales. Typically, with your hand lens, you can look to a lot of of details, and this was not possible in the virtual fieldwork. And 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 the students miss a bit. Uh, of, of that and were negatively impacted by the sometimes the lack of resolution uh, in the virtual field work. And the lack of being physically in the outdoor field work. Yeah, students from, from the survey again, um, the student uh, responses shown that they were missing the field work experience. Yeah, the fact to be able to be in the nature, to, to walk and, 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 and all of that, which I completely understand. But um, interestingly, the virtual fieldwork also has some advantages when we look to the psychomotor domain of Floney. And for example, the immersive 3D environment, on environment allows the students to move around outcrops. So it replicates quite well the outdoor fieldwork because you, was, you were like in a video game, you were able to move around the, the, the outcrops that were represented in three dimensions. And if you want, um, you were able to study an outcrop in really a similar way than if you were in the outdoor field work. Um, the, our, our students in, in the survey said as well, they were quite happy that in the virtual field work, if you have to walk three, four, five kilometers, or if you have to climb a very big hill, is really easy. And sometimes you can even fly in the virtual field work, while in the outdoor field work, uh, it can be sometimes physically really tiring to do that. Yeah, so at the same time, the lack of being physically in the, in the outdoor field, but in the same time, they were quite happy when we have to walk like four kilometers to do that in the virtual field rather than in the outdoor field. And uh, the last point is really interesting, is that we saw us as a lecturer a uh, similar students' behavior in the virtual field work than in the outdoor field work. So let me just show you an example by coming back to some of my picture, this one. So when we are in the outdoor field work, there are some characteristic student behavior. So for example, when we do here introduction and summaries, the students usually just make a group like this, they face the lecturer, of course, because they need to hear what the lecturer is saying and they need to show what they are drawing or, or showing on, on, uh, on, on with their hands and, and, and all of that, fully understandable. But when it comes to the virtual field trip, so students don't need to do that, yeah? You are hearing what the lecturer is saying, even if your avatar is at four kilometers from, from the avatar of the lecturer, and you don't need to face the lecturer because you can see what they show on your screen uh, anyway, yeah, even if you're at four kilometers off of the lecturer. But what we saw in the virtual field um, is that the students were having exactly the same behavior. They were grouping during introduction and summaries and facing, you can see that. So in red, it is a lecturer avatar. In blue, it is a student avatars. And here we are during one of the summary points and the avatars of the students are grouped and facing the lecturer. So this is quite really, really uh, interesting point. I have also example of that. Um, 
Typically, in the virtual fieldwork, we were able to reproduce roads with cars on this road. And if uh, you were walking in the road and the car arrived, you can have an accident. Yeah, so you can be hurt by the car and then your avatar is put upside down and it takes like 10, 10 seconds for your avatar to be put on their feet again and, and, and you can continue. So it's quite funny. All, of course, I will not lie to you. At first, uh, the students, they all get hit by a car. And, and because it's quite funny the first time, but then it, it soon became quite annoying because your avatar is put upside down like this and you need to wait 10 seconds to, 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 to start again. And what we saw after this first event where everyone played and had, had fun by hitting by a car, which is not great from a safe, safety point of view, I, 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 I give you that, um, is that our students were all working uh, along the road to avoid the car. So this is a good thing from a safety point of view. Exactly what they would done, of course, in the outdoor field work. And they were calling each other when a car arrived. And this is something that we saw exactly the same behavior in the outdoor field work. Yeah, we walk along the car. Sometimes we can be quite elongating along the road. And when a student see a car, usually we ask them from a, from a safety point of view to just say that quite loudly to all students. So usually students say, car! And everyone knows that a car arrived and, and we are quite safe. And we saw exactly the same behavior in the outdoor field work. The students were doing that in the same way. Again, very interesting. And just to finish on that, because, sorry, I I don't know if you are uh, interested by that as, as much as I am, uh, but the last example that I have, can come back to my, to my slide, um, is that we saw some students uh, filming each other. So they just take a screenshot of, of their screen or take some videos of their, of, their, of their screen, like jumping from a waterfall in the virtual fieldwork. So we are able to recreate the waterfalls. And they were filming their avatars jumping from the waterfall, swimming into the water, and they put that on social media. And this is, again, a behavior uh, that is really similar to what the students do in the outdoor field work. So it was really, really interesting to see how some similar students' behavior were observed in the outdoor field work, in the virtual field work, compared to the outdoor field work. So again, the virtual field work, in that sense, is able to reproduce quite a lot of uh, the psychomotor domain of learning. And finally, I will quickly finish on the affective domain of learning, so related to the emotional state. Um, some advantages of the virtual fieldwork is that it's always go good weather in the virtual fieldwork, while sometimes if you have few days of rain, like four or five days of rain, it can directly impact your emotional state and you can be demotivated by that or if you are cold and this is not a problem in the virtual fieldwork. You are able to revisit an outcrop in the virtual fieldwork, which is not the case in the outdoor fieldwork. Um, field and this directly, um, it, it's what we saw from our survey sent to students. The students say that they had less time-related stress thanks to that in the virtual fieldwork compared to the outdoor fieldwork. Less pressure from peers as well. Um, I think the fact to be quite isolated, everyone in front of their laptop, they felt less pressure from peers. So what I call pressure from peers is typically when we are in the outdoor fieldwork, if a student is seeing another student working in the evening, they will feel a pressure and they will feel that they have to work as well. And what we see us as lecturers, even if we told them that they don't need to work on that specific evening, if they only see one student doing that at the end, after a few minutes, you have everyone uh, working. So this is what I call the pressure from peers. And this is it's better in the virtual fieldwork. It's less pressure from peers. And finally, in the virtual field work, we don't have to work during weekends. So this directly affects your do affective domain of learning. Yeah, you can rest and, and, and start again on a Monday. While when we are in the outdoor field work, of course, it costs a lot of money to pay for accommodation, transport, and all of that, and food. And so we usually work also during, during weekends. Um, the negative point is that it was more difficult to keep motivated, some communications barriers as well in the virtual fieldwork, and no sense of place, no immersive atmosphere. This, uh, the students uh, um, miss that, the fact that they, they, they were not um, within the, the, the field, in the, typically eating pizza in Italy, they were missing this sort of immersive um, experience. 
So conclusion of, of, of our study, um, virtual fieldwork taught using these interactive 3D virtual outcrop models replicate as closely as possible the outdoor fieldwork learning experience. So this is what our studies show. But it seems that, uh, it, of course, it's impossible to reproduce all aspects of the experience of being in the outdoor field. And it's true that from our survey, we saw that students were missing the ability to touch rock, for example, or to examine all exposures in arbitrarily uh, fine details. So our study recommends to use virtual field trips in addition to physical field work and not to replace it. Um, and, and, and this was directly a wish from, from the students. Um, we also conclude that virtual field work is a good means of accessing this valued pedagogy of earth science. We strongly believe in ESC at Imperial that field work is very important. It's a very important valued um, pedagogy of earth science. And finally, the study concluded that virtual fieldwork will make the geosciences more inclusive and attractive to a wider range of, of students. So that's why we want to include virtual fieldwork in our fieldwork, but not completely replace them. So we will continue with, with outdoor fieldwork, but you should expect to have some virtual element um, associated to that while it was not the case before pandemic. So it is the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.